Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jesse Hallett. Uh, I work at Jive Software as a JavaScript engineer. But today, I'm here to talk to you about Android devices, and in particular, how you can get control of your Android device by installing you know, a custom version of Android on it. And so the first question to ask, of course, is why you would want to do that. Uh, and perhaps you all already have some ideas, but um, you know, there's um, a couple of good advantages. One is that you can get root access to your device by installing a custom ROM. Uh, and as some people say, if you, don't, if you can't get root, you don't own it. <laughs> and then um, uh, you know, there are some practical advantages to having root device to a device, uh, root access to a device as well. Uh, for example, I found that um, when trying to make backups of an unrooted device, you know, it was kind of difficult or impossible to get back to backups of every single thing on the device. Uh, also, um, I'm giving the, my presentation here on an Android device. Uh, once I had root access to this one, I was able to, do, able to put Linux on it uh, in a true jail so that I can run Android and Ubuntu Linux at the same time, something that's not possible without root access. But probably the most compelling reason to upgrade uh, or to, to um, mod your device to install a custom operating system is to prolong the life of uh, a device that is no longer receiving software updates from the manufacturer, which uh, yes, is a particular problem with Android. Uh, here's a history of uh, all the Android releases to date. And the latest version, of course, is Jelly Bean Android 4.2. Uh, and yet there are still plenty of devices out there that are stuck on gingerbread, uh, Android 2.3, and are just kind of languishing there, despite the fact that in internet time, gingerbread is ancient. And uh, even devices that are in the more modern era, uh, there are still plenty that are stuck on ice cream sandwich, and those that have been upgraded to Jelly Bean, um, some are still stuck, or many are still stuck on Android 4.1. Uh, Google actually named the last two releases Jelly Bean uh, in order to try to mitigate this problem. And so um, I, in particular, wanted to uh, mod this phone here, which is a Nexus S, because uh, you know, it's still a really great device, but you know, it stopped receiving updates. So it wasn't going to get the Android 4.2 update, but I wanted Android 4.2. And then on top of that, pretty soon, some Sometime this year, probably Google is going to release the next release, uh, Key Lime Pi. In the meantime, they've been uh, releasing images like this just to tease people. There, there is a Key Lime Pi right there. And if history, uh, if precedent holds, then no, not many devices will be running Key Lime Pi for a while. But despite that, I think that Android is a great operating system, so I really like using it. And the fact that you know, uh, the operating system is open source and there are people out there making custom versions of it and allowing you to install those custom versions on your phone is a way around this problem of you know, manufacturers not supporting devices for very long. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about. And to start with, Android is Linux. Uh, so a lot of the principles of customizing Linux and working with Linux machine also apply to Android devices. Um, so yeah, it's just a little computer on a phone. Um, it runs you know, your basic Linux kernel, and it's just got, uh, you know, it's just a very minimal Linux distribution with kind of a lockdown file system and this Java GUI layer on top. Uh, but yeah, because of that, there are some, um, Let me demonstrate that Android is Linux. I'm going to open a shell here, which is available. Now, there are several shell applications available in the Android market, so it's really easy to get into Linux land on any Android device, even without rooting it. And so it can run some commands. Uh, and you can see that, you know, uh, from this we can see that each app in uh, Android gets its own user account, and even its own home directory. Uh, and you know, this is just usual Linux stuff that you would expect. I can run some uname stuff and prove that it's Linux and see the kernel version. It's running a not too old kernel version. And we can see stuff like you know, we're running an ARM v7 chip with uh, symmetric multiprocessing and so forth. And then um, you can go a bit further and see some details that are 
a little less usual for Linux systems. For example, if I just ran the mount command to see what file systems are mounted on this device, and there are a lot of them. It looks like every app on the device uh, gets its own little lockdown file system. So going down this list, uh, we can see um, I've forgotten what I'm looking at. OK, for example, now my Instapaper app here has its own file system now that is, a, now that is this block device. And so that seems to be a way of encapsulating data for each app in a way that makes it inaccessible to other apps. But what we're really concerned with uh, for this presentation is you know, the, uh, the partitions that the operating system live on. Uh, here's a, a diagram of you know, your typical Linux PC and how uh, its boot process works. Uh, you have, um, when your machine power is on, uh, it activates a BIOS. Or as I learned in a talk yesterday, that BIOS is actually being replaced with UEFI. But you know, either way, it activates some firmware, which looks for a bootable hard drive in the system, and then uh, reads uh, a bootloader off the master, master boot record of that hard drive. And uh, that's just you know, a space of about two megabytes at the beginning of the hard drive that's, not, uh, that's left unallocated and is not put in any partition. And that's where your bootloader lives. And in Linux, that's grub. And so when you boot up, uh, grub is loaded up. Uh, if you've ever installed Linux on a multi-boot system, and you boot up your computer and you see a menu telling you uh, which operating system you want to choose, uh, which operating system you want to boot up with. That's the Grub interface. And uh, no, that's the software running from the bootloader before the actual operating system is loaded. And then the bootloader uh, knows how to uh, look at, another, at an actual disk partition and to read a kernel and RAM disk off of that partition. Uh, on a Linux machine, that's often a special boot partition, although not always. It may be that it, it reads uh, your kernel off of you know, your whole entire root partition. But anyway, the bootloader reads the kernel off of disk and then hands over control of that, and then you're in an operating system. And so that's the multi-stage boot process. And it's basically the same on Android, is the point. Uh, although this picture looks a little different on Android because it's got a specialized set of partitions. Uh, like many typical Linux, um, oh, first of all, there is no real standard for the way that Linux devices are partitioned. And so the, these details are different on a lot of devices, but this is kind of the platonic ideal of an Android partitioning scheme. Um, but um, anyway, uh, you'll often see a boot partition, just like a typical Linux machine, which has you know, a kernel on it and a RAM disk. And then uh, a system partition, uh, which contains basically all of your operating system. So the Android operating system itself uh, during normal operation of an Android device, both of those partitions are read-only. Uh, and then your read-write partition is uh, slash data there. And so when you install an app via the App Store or when your app saves any data, uh, that is going into the data partition. And so it's kept separate from the stuff that's pre-installed by the operating system. Uh, then you've got uh, often a cache partition, which is uh, just for temporary data. You can think of it basically as a scratch. Um, and a uh, MISC partition. Um, and or, I'm not going to talk a lot about that except to say that, um, no, oh, sorry, question. Oh, okay, the question is, in the application manager, you can delete an application's data or just its cache. Does the cache go into that cache partition? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think probably yes. Um, okay. And then, so the MISC partition holds, uh, is another read-only partition. It, it just holds um, details about how the hardware is configured. For example, you know, I think um, you know, how the USB interface is supposed to operate, I think, like uh, details about what frequencies the radio radios and the devices are supposed to run on. And so stuff that's going to be specific kind of to you know, that device and the you know, GSM or cellular networks it's supposed to connect to. And so the only thing you need to know about that partition really is that if it gets corrupted or damaged in any way, you're in big trouble. Uh, yes? Is that actual uh, read-only partition, or is that like proc, where it's a, where it's 
I believe it's actually a partition and that it is possible to replace it. Uh, it is possible to write new data to it if you're uh, particularly an, an enterprising. Although that might be another thing that varies from device to device. And then um, in addition, you've got uh, an SD card partition, which nowadays on most devices is not actually an external SD card, but is actually an internal partition, which is going to be you know, the really big one that holds uh, you know, the most data. So when you get a device and it's advertised as having 32 gigabytes of memory, most of that is going to be on the internal SD card partition. And that is used by um, certain apps that are uh, set up to write to that partition instead of to the internal data partition. And it's also something that you, know, you can access as the user and you can store arbitrary files there and read arbitrary files from it. And so it's for personal stuff that does not fall into the data partition. Uh, so one issue that is sometimes encountered with this uh, scheme is that uh, the data partition can be kind of small. And so uh, if you install too many apps, you find that you run out of space it won't, and the operating system won't let you install more apps or may even fail to update existing apps because there's just not enough free space, even though there may be uh, tons of space available on the SD card partition. And so one of the ways you can deal with that is by uh, installing a custom operating system and using that to either repartition to increase the size of the data partition or another option that is somewhat safer is to partition your SD card partition, split it into two to create a new partition called SD Ext. And then uh, some custom Android builds are configured uh, to put uh, stuff that would normally go into the data partition into that SD Ext partition instead. And that way you can have much more space for your, uh, for your apps and things. And then I kind of skipped over recovery. Uh, recovery is a very important partition, and that holds basically a second operating system, a very small one. Uh, and what that does is um, it provides utilities for uh, installing operating system updates or uh, wiping partitions. So on a PC, if you want to install a new operating system or um, you know, mess with your uh, partitions or wipe things or whatnot, you would typically boot from a, a, a CD or from a USB drive. And so you can't really do that in Android. So you have a recovery partition instead, which has this you know, utility operating system for doing that kind of stuff while the uh, main operating system is unloaded. So that's going to be a very important part of customizing your device, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So putting, oh, OK. Uh, and now this is just to illustrate again kind of the distinction between the data partition and SD card. Um, this is uh, a look at a typical app in your Android settings. And you can see that it's telling us how much space the app is taking up. Uh, it's 16.32 megabytes. That's going to be on the data partition. And uh, it's also taking up uh, 468 kilobytes of space on the data partition again. Uh, but this one also, because it uh, downloads music and deals with a lot of data, stores some of its data on the uh, SD card partition, which here is called USB storage, uh, over 200 megabytes. And that's stuff that just wouldn't fit on the data partition. Uh, and so another thing you can do to free up space in your data partition is use this move to USB storage option to move the app from the internal data partition to the internal SD card partition. And that can help a bit. Uh, it'll still leave uh, some, uh, uh, yeah, some space used on the data partition, which is just like kind of a pointer to the new location. So if we put that all together, we can see um, that the picture of an Android, boot process, uh, Android device booting up is pretty similar to a PC booting up, uh, but with some uh, small differences. Uh, for one thing, instead of you know, the BIOS or UEFI, we have a propri proprietary firmware, but it performs the same function. And it looks for a bootloader on your Android device. Um, instead of Grub, we've got you know, this Android bootloader that comes with um, a feature called Fastboot. Uh, uh, which is another kind of administration tool. Um, but kind of like when you're booting up on a, mach a machine with Grub, and you can get in the operating system selection, and you can use Grub's other tools to like, tweak the, your boot parameters before you actually boot in the main operating system, 
on Android, you can stop in fast boot mode in your bootloader and use that mode to do things like install signed updates that are provided by uh, the phone's manufacturer or to install, uh, install a new uh, operating system under the recovery partition. Um, anyway, fast boot in turn loads the main operating system and it's got options to either go straight to the uh, boot, which loads up the kernel for the main Android operating system and then uh, boots as normally, or instead it can go into the recovery uh, OS if you want to perform recovery operations. So basically every Android device is kind of a dual boot setup. Um, what this means is uh, for uh, customizing is you're going to want to install, you're going to want to take um, you know, some operating system update from the internet that is not signed by the phone's manufacturer and install it. And by default, Android devices are, will only install updates that are signed by the manufacturer. Uh, so to allow installing uh, you know, custom stuff, you're going to need a custom recovery. Um, and uh, in order to install a custom recovery, you're going to need to go into fast boot mode and use its flashing feature to put a new uh, uh, yeah, to put a new operating system on there. Uh, but again, Fastboot will only install signed things. And so uh, to make that work, you're going to have to unlock the bootloader uh, to um, let it allow you to, un uh, to install arbitrary stuff. So that's the first step to uh, modding any phone or tablet. And the procedure for unlocking your device varies quite a bit from device to device. Um, I did a little research. I looked at um, you know, the unlock procedures for a bunch of different devices to try to come up with recommendations about which brands and manufacturers tend to make it easy to unlock your phone and provide a clear path for customizing your hardware and which brands do not do that. And so this is not comprehensive and just based on my own research, but these are the manufacturers that I identified that tend to yeah, release official unlock tools to make it easy for you to unlock your phone. Uh, for example, example all, all Google Nexus brand devices are really easy to unlock. Uh, it's kind of a no-fuss process. Uh, Acer uh, makes a, you know, a handful of tablets. They're, uh, the tablets that I looked at uh, also are unlocked in the same way. It's really easy. Um, and then uh, Asus provides visual unlock tools. Uh, there's a slightly different process in that. Um, yeah, but it's still pretty easy. Well, one thing with Asus is that uh, they, in the past, have had a tendency to release the unlock tool sometime after the hardware is released. So you don't know right at launch if it's definitely going to be unlockable or not. But all of the tablets that are out there now, I think, are unlockable. And then um, HTC and Sony seem to be pretty good about this, but uh, there's, it's a little more uh, complicated there. Um, for HTC, it looks like newer devices uh, can be unlocked using an official tool. Uh, but older devices are, with older devices, it's more difficult. So I looked, um, if, you're, if you've got an H HTC device made this year, or released this year, then you're pretty much good to go. Uh, but if you're using something older, like a MyTouch, there's a more involved process. Um, and uh, according to what I read, um, uh, HTC's version of unlocking may leave you in a place where your uh, recovery, um, recovery OS is more restricted than it would be uh, on other devices, like in some cases you may not be able to actually install your own kernel, and I'm not sure how you get around that. But uh, yeah, according to the wiki uh, that I read, um, uh, with devices released in this year, it's better. And then Sony seems to provide official unlocks for basically all of its Xperia phones. And in fact, a website says that any Xperia device released after 2011, or most of them, should be unlockable. Uh, although they say that whether or not you can unlock a particular device may depend on what carrier you're on. And if you want, want to unlock your Sony device, you, uh, what you do is you um, look up your phone's IMEI number, uh, unique identifier, you submit that to Sony, and then if they want to allow you to unlock that device, they send you back an unlock code, and then you can use that to proceed. Uh, so it's, it's uh, not as straightforward as, as the other options. Uh, you have to have Sony's permission. Uh, when I, uh, and I click the dimension, when you unlock an HTC device, it appears they make you sign up for an HTC developer account. 
and then the not so good brands. Uh, no, there are, uh, some of these things are unlockable, but no. Uh, so it looks like for basically all LG devices, for example, you don't have an unlock tool provided by the manufacturer. If you want to unlock your bootloader, you have to use um, an exploit uh, that leverages a security vulnerability in the phone. Uh, the, um, the tool that runs that exploit is called Zerg Rush. So that's, an open, that's, I think, an open source project that you know, is based on reverse engineering that vulnerability. Um, and you know, um, and although it's great that you can use such exploits to uh, modify phones that otherwise would be completely locked down, it's a problematic way to go because you know, often those exploits get patched in later releases of the operating system because it's not good to leave those lying around. So if you've got an LG device and it's, you've installed too many over-the-air updates, it may, not, uh, it may be no longer possible or maybe much more difficult than it would otherwise be uh, to unlock the bootloader. Uh, with Motorola, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, Motorola does have an official unlocker, but it only works for two of their phones and two of their tablets. And one of those phones is a developer edition. So um, that is that's not good enough to get them into the good brands column, and in my opinion. Um, for the rest of their devices, again, you have to use a security exploit and the tool, uh, using a tool called Razor's Edge to uh, exploit that vulnerability. And it looks like in a lot of cases, you cannot replace the kernel that is uh, installed by the manufacturer on your device, and you have to use a kernel feature called KExec uh, to have the existing kernel hand, hand over to uh, your, the new kernel for your new operating system, which is kind of hacky. And then um, uh, Samsung devices, um, the except, uh, are, yeah, they generally don't provide an unlock either. The exception being that any uh, Samsung devices sold under the Nexus brand are easily unlockable. Uh, and now I'm disappointed that Samsung is in this column because I really like their phones. Uh, but I think the solution there is to buy the Nexus branded Samsung phones if you want one. Uh, and I've also read that uh, Samsung is planning to release or possibly sell through Google a, an unlo unlocked version of their new phone, the uh, Galaxy S4. Um, and so that may be as easy to unlock as a Nexus device, I'm not sure. Uh, but for their non-Nexus devices, um, and particular for the Galaxy devices, uh, you have to use this tool called Heimdall to unlock the bootloader. It turns out that Samsung has an uh, internal tool called Odin, which can do things like unlock the bootloader. Uh, somehow Odin was leaked, I, I think this is what happened, and uh, some enterprising individuals reverse engineered the wire protocol that it speaks. Um, Odin is a uh, utility, it runs on a PC, you connect the phone uh, to, uh, when it's in fast boot mode to your uh, PC using USB, and then use Odin to send commands over USB to uh, give instructions to the phone's bootloader. So uh, yeah, Heimdall is a reverse engineered version of Odin uh, that can unlock the bootloader, but it appears to involve uh, overwriting portions of the bootloader in a way that's not entirely safe in that you know, uh, if something fails well that operation is in progress, you could end up with a bricked phone. Uh, so um, when you're doing something like that, it's very important your phone not lose power, the battery not die while that operation is going on, and the, uh, the USB cable doesn't become unconnected while that's going on, because either one could cause uh, uh, bootloader modification to be interrupted partway through and be left in a corrupted state. And there's also a note I read that um, in some cases, Samsung's USB uh, device can be buggy. And so sometimes you can end up with a bricked phone, uh, even if you do everything correctly. I'm not sure how high that risk is, but the point is that it's much, much uh, better to get a, to unlock a phone that provide, has you know, a blessed unlock tool provided by the manufacturer because it's almost always going to be safer. But that being said, it's still possible to unlock and modify. Uh, many of the phones provided by these manufacturers, for example, Leif has a Galaxy S2 that he's uh, uh, installed a custom operating system on, and so a lot, plenty of people have great success modifying these phones anyway. So once you've uh, got your device and identified how to unlock it, you're going to need to pick uh, a custom operating system to install on it, um, and there are lots of options out there. And um, you know, 
there are different projects with different goals. Uh, some of them just want to provide you know, a customized version of you know, the Android experience uh, with root access probably. Uh, some uh, emphasize broad device support. Some are designed uh, focused for uh, operating on a particular device that the uh, developer is interested in. Um, a common th theme with all of these projects is that they're all, um, uh, or none of them make money. Uh, all of these operating systems are made by people you know, doing this in their spare time uh, who are scratching an itch. And it's usually uh, along the lines of, I have this phone, I want to install my custom software on it, I'm going to put in the work to make that happen. Uh, here are three options that are, seem to be particularly popular. Um, and yeah, CyanogenMod is one that I use a lot, uh, and it has, you know, quite broad device support, although it focuses on phones, so its support for tablets is a little thin. Um, and it's possibly the most popular um, uh, custom operating system out there, in part because uh, you know, they support a lot of devices. They, uh, uh, they get new Android versions out pretty quickly when uh, Google releases an updated version of Android. And they have a wiki with really good instructions for how, how to work with each device, how to unlock each device, how to install the update on each device. And then uh, AOKP is uh, similar. It's uh, got some, uh, yeah, pretty similar to Cyanogen. Uh, it's got some more customizations um, and maybe doesn't have quite this broad device support. Uh, uh, the name comes from, you know, is based on the open source release of Android that comes from Google, which is called the Android Open Source Project, or AOSP. And all, all of these projects take that and then apply their modifications to it. And so this, this one is called the Android Open Kang Project instead of Open Source Project, therefore AOKP. But I don't know what Kang means. And then uh, I don't know much about MIUI, but it came up on a life hacker list of top, top five Android ROMs. And it looks like it's, I mean, it's pretty polished. And it comes from China. Which, uh, but it has been uh, localized into English and other languages. And so that's another option that people seem to like. And see, these are kind of the mainstream options. Uh, sometimes you'll find out there's not you know, really great uh, support for your device from one of these projects, or you, know, you want something special. And so there, there are also plenty of more specialized projects out there. For example, um, on this tablet, I'm running Androwook Prime. Harry Bean, uh, which is um, you know, a custom operating system designed specifically for uh, Asus tablets. And what they do is instead of taking the vanilla open source Android release and customizing that, they take the, uh, the um, uh, Android uh, provided by Asus with its Asus customization, which is already kind of customized for these tablets, and then they add their own customizations to that. And they do things like swap out the kernel, uh, you know, add in a bunch of utilities and other customizations. And of course, give you the tools to get root access. And then there's another one is Virtuous ROM, which seems to be focused on uh, HTC devices. And that's probably because the people who work on Virtuous have HTC devices that they want to be able to customize. Uh, so. Yeah, if your device is supported by something like Cyanogen Mod or AOKP, that's probably the best option because you know, those are widely used and have good support. Um, but sometimes you find, uh, you know, um, yeah, again, one of your device isn't really well supported by one of the major uh, projects, or uh, you know, a new version of Android has come out and it's not you know, supported, or, and there isn't a build of that available for your device in, from, say, Cyanogen, and you want to get an early update. Uh, there are lots of you know, threads on the XDA developers forum along the lines of, here I've created a custom build of Android for this device, and you can use it now. And you know, it, it seems a bunch of, of you know, quality ROMs are actually released that way. And RootsWiki is another forum where this kind of stuff comes out. Um, learning about how to mod, mod Android devices and all this stuff is interesting because there isn't really um, uh, central place where you, you know, all this information is recorded. And I looked around for a book on the subject, but I didn't find one. Um, if there is one, I'd, like, I'd be interested in, in finding out. But basically, uh, you know, I collect this information uh, by scouring the internet, looking at blogs, wikis, 
uh, and especially sources like XDA developers and RootsWiki, where there are lots of forum threads explaining you know, how to do things for a particular device, what this uh, particular situation is. And so you know, that's the way uh, Android modding tends to happen. And if you have trouble like trusting a site with a Z in the name, I don't blame you. <laughs> but you know, the people who know what they're doing and who have this, uh, the information you need to work with uh, Android customization tend to congregate on forums like these. Uh, so once you've chosen a ROM, uh, you'll get a zip file. And it, it might look something like this. In this case, this is you know, a recent release of CyanogenMod uh, that was tailored specifically for this, this phone. Um, uh, yeah, unlike PCs where you've got a standardization so that you can take you know, one you know, bootable CD or something and put it in kind of any computer, uh, with Android you have to get an operating system update that is built specifically for the device that you're using. And so any project that is releasing uh, uh, customized operating systems will have a list of devices they support and specific builds for those devices. Um, I'm not sure exactly why it is that each uh, update has to be customized for a specific device. It could be uh, that they need to have specific drivers compiled into each one, or it could be that you know, they need to build, be built uh, to, to accommodate the particular partitioning schemes of the device that you're using. Um, but that seems to be the way it is. So anyway, this is a CyanogenMod ROM for this phone. And um, it's a zip file, so we can peek inside it and see kind of what it's doing. Uh, if you do that, you see a file list like this. Um, I know it's too small to read. This is just kind of give an impression of what's in there. Basically, there are a whole lot of files uh, under a directory called uh, system. And because uh, it's just a list of files that this update is going to uh, install onto your system partition, you know, where the main operating system files live. Um, yeah, it's not, uh, ROMs typically do not wipe up, uh, the system partition and, and just install something from scratch uh, the way you might see um, like uh, a Linux installer do. Instead, they just kind of unpack files and add them onto that partition. And so that way you can often do something like install multiple, uh, yeah, multiple um, update packages uh, all at once uh, to, get, to add on additional features. Um, in addition to all the stuff that goes into the system partition, oh, yes, question? Does that mean you would if you have a large span of uh, updates to catch up on, do you have to start at the beginning and work your way forward? Oh, okay. Does that mean if you have a large span of updates to catch on, do you have to start at the beginning and work your way forward? Uh, actually, no. Um, so the, uh, any, um, yeah, any operating system update you get from one of these projects will have all the files you need for that version. Uh, and so it's not in, the updates aren't incremental uh, in that way. Uh, I should explain more what I meant. Um, what you often do is install something like a CyanogenMod update, which ins uh, has, uh, installs you know, all the Android operating system stuff based on the open source release of Android. And you install one more update, which would be the gapps package, which contains all the, which is provided by Google and provides all the uh, apps and utilities that are not open source, that are proprietary. But it's often shipped as a separate bundle and so that's two zip files you typically install together. Although some, uh, some custom OSs bundle the G apps into their main distribution. Uh, yeah. So I would have the, pretty much the same question, but I wasn't happy with the answer. Oh, okay. Um, so when you've got a series of updates and they change different sets of files, unless later updates include all the files changed in all the earlier updates, you probably do need to go through them in order or at least go through them. Yeah, go through them. Because otherwise, what happens is I bring in update three, and that updates X, Y, Z, Z, Y, you know, whatever. And then I bring in update two, which also updates X, Y, Z, Z, Y, but with the older version now. So you'd want to update them in order. Okay. Does that uh, make sense? If, uh, if what you said was. Yes. Um, so I'm saying if, if, you're, if you've got multiple updates, you need to make sure to apply them in order because. Now one may not uh, may, may not replace all the files that another update put in place. It might update a file. So if there's a bug fix and then it turns out that that bug fix is inadequate and a newer bug fix comes out on the same file, if you apply them out of order, you could overwrite, you could apply the correct bug fix and then later on and apply the incorrect bug fix over the top of it. Okay. So you yeah. should call you in order, right? Right. 
so if, if you apply updates out of order, you might get a bug fix in one that's reversed by another one, at, another older one if you apply it later. And yeah, that's absolutely true. But, so typically what you, I've been using the word update, but really it's an you know, entire operating system distribution. So you'd install that and it would overwrite almost everything in your system partition with new, new files. Uh, and yeah, you wouldn't want to install an older version of the operating system after that unless you wanted to downgrade. Um, but uh, what makes it like an update as opposed to just a complete operating system distribution is that when a new version of the operating system comes out, you can take that zip file and push that in the system partition and upgrade without having to uh, wipe your system partition and without losing any of your data. Um, Um, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, the point there is uh, how do you back everything up so that, you know, if you upgrade your phone and then decide you don't like it, uh, uh, so that you'll be able to downgrade back to the, the version you had before, uh, and, you know, you want to make sure you don't lose data when you upgrade. Um, yes, those are very good points. I was planning to talk about backing up a little bit more um, a, little, a little later on. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to be... Um, hanging out in the Hacker Lounge tomorrow. My idea was that you know, after this talk, anyone who's interested in going ahead and modding your devices, come to the Hacker Lounge, uh, talk to me or other people who are hanging out there, and get any questions answered. So that's, that would be a good thing to talk about there. Also, Nexus 4 oh, very nice. Uh, so yes, there are, there are ways to back everything up so that generally you can restore. It's much easier to back stuff up once you've got root access, so there's kind of a chicken and an egg problem. Um, uh, anyway, moving forward for the moment. Um, so yeah, this installs a bunch of stuff to the system partition. In addition, there's a, a file in there called boot.img, and that is uh, just a raw disk image. And so when you install this update, it's going to yeah, wipe your boot partition uh, and put this new file system on there that contains a new kernel and a new RAM disk. Uh, and so, you know, unlike the system partition, the boot partition is just wiped and replaced when you install one of these operating systems. And finally, um, there are some meta inf there's a meta-inf directory there with uh, some files including an updater script. And uh, if we take a peek inside uh, the updater script file, you can see that um, this isn't just a file dump, there are a whole lot of uh, no, particular uh, instructions being run when you uh, install this, uh, this update. Uh, and it's doing things like specifically uh, specifying where files are going to, supposed to be copied onto the device and setting permissions on those files. And there's a line in there that uh, actually uh, you know, overwrites your boot partition with that boot.img file. Uh, I installed one uh, ROM that actually had you know, a big graphical wizard that ran as part of the uh, installation process uh, that allowed you to select like which kernel you want to use and which apps you want to install or leave out. Um, and so, uh, yeah, these, uh, these ROMs that you install are not just you know, dumping things under your, under your file system. They can be you know, scripted installers. Um, I mentioned you need a recovery image to install, uh, to be able to install the operating system and um, there are two available, as far as I know, these are the two most popular uh, options. Um, and again, these are just hobbyist projects, uh, but you know, indispensable to uh, Android modders. Uh, so Clockwork Mod is probably the most popular, uh, and it works great. Uh, and then another one is uh, the TWRP, the Team Win Recovery Project. And uh, I use that one, and the reason for that is the last time I checked Clockwork Mod did not support uh, devices using Android's full disk encryption feature, uh, which is something that I use, but uh, the TWRP project does. Uh, and so that would be a reason to use that one instead. So that stands for Team Win Recovery Partition? Uh, team, team Win Recovery Project, yes. And so, OK, uh, with that background in place, let's go through an example of you know, uh, how to actually perform an update. Uh, and this is sort of the happy path if you've got a Nexus device. 
uh, this is what it's going to look like. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is install a ADB and Fastboot utilities. And these are provided by Google. They're part of the Android uh, SDK. Uh, they run on your computer. Uh, ADB is the Android debugging bridge. Uh, Fastboot is a utility for talking to your, uh, your device while it's in its bootloader's Fastboot mode. Um, And if you're on, an, uh, on a Ubuntu system, these are just in the, you know, the software repository, you can, so you can just run this command to install them. Otherwise, you, know, you can download these uh, as binaries directly from Google. And uh, you know, once that's installed and you have your phone connected to your computer via USB, you can try running this command, uh, adb devices l to make sure it's talking to your device. Uh, this is while the phone is booted up and running. Um, and uh, usually this just works, and you'll see you know, a report uh, that this device is attached. Although, no, before you do that, before you're actually able to communicate with a device, you have to go into your uh, phone's developer options and tick the box that says enable USB debugging. Uh, because otherwise, basically for security purposes, your phone will not listen to uh, you know, ADB connections on a USB interface unless you've explicitly told it to. And so again, for your security reasons, you probably want to tick this box when you're upgrading your phone and untick it when you're done. Oh. Question. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of an annoying feature, but yeah. On newer Android versions, uh, as of Android 4.2, I think, uh, the developer options is hidden until you go into your settings, uh, go into About Phone, uh, find the build number, tap on it seven times, and you'll see a message saying, like, X more taps to enable developer options. And then the developer options entry will temporarily appear in your settings, and then you'll be able to access this setting. Uh, yep. What's the attack path if you just have USB on? Um, that's a good question, but I've only got like three minutes, so I'd like to talk to you about that after the talk. Yeah. Airport charging stations. Airport charging stations? Okay. Okay, good point. Uh, and so, yeah, make sure to back up everything, as uh, you say, before doing anything to your device. Uh, it's very important to point out that unlocking the bootloader step that I talked about. Uh, will almost always wipe everything on the device. Uh, that's everything in your data partition, so all your apps and data, and also everything on your SD card partition. And that's, uh, you know, that's supposedly a security feature. Probably not a bad idea. Uh, um, yeah, the first time you're upgrading and installing a custom operating system, you can expect your device to be entirely wiped. Uh, uh, after you've got that custom operating system installed and you want to install a new version, you can usually do that without anything being wiped. Um, but you probably want to back things up anyway, just in case. Uh, this is a tool for a using Android Debugging Bridge to back up kind of everything in your system. Uh, and so it's an easy way to go. It gives you a dump file that you can then restore onto uh, the device later. Uh, this did not work for me, but it might work for you. Uh, and I think this tends to work better if you have root access to your device. So again, chicken and egg. Uh, but there are other backup options. Um, oh, oh. And so, so I notice you've got that's the interface shows that it's at least Android 4.0. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, this screenshot is Android 4.1. Uh, I think that ADB backup supports older operating systems, but I'm not sure which, which versions it supports. Um, and so you get, um, I'm going to kind of speed through here in the 60 seconds. Um, so you can use ADB to boot your device into that fast boot mode where you just got your bootloader loaded up. Uh, if you don't have a computer available and you want to do this without a computer, or if your operating system is not bootable for some reason, you can do that without ADB just by like power on the phone and like hold down. You see either the volume down or the volume up button while it's booting, and you'll volume up, down, down? okay, down, <laughs> and you'll get a you'll get a menu. And so it's a handy way to recover if uh, your operating system is no longer bootable, but you can get into fast boot mode or recovery mode to fix it. And uh, fast boot mode looks like this. It's just a bunch of text. And you'll see some options, uh, like continue booting or boot in recovery mode. And you know, at this point, you can connect to USB and do stuff with it. Um, 
then you use the Fastboot utility to talk to Fastboot and tell to unlock the phone. Uh, on a Nexus or an Acer device, this is how you do it, and it's really easy. You just run this unlock command, and it's done. Uh, and uh, at the point, everything is wiped. And it says, all right, you want to wipe everything. And I don't have time to go through the rest of this, unfortunately. But if you want to find me in the Hacker Lounge tomorrow, I'm planning to be there at 10.15. So just drop in, uh, bring your device. And uh, I'm happy to talk to you, uh, answer questions. Um, if you want to set up before that, like uh, tonight when you get home, uh, try to back up as much stuff on your, pos on your phone as possible. Uh, you can use My Backup Pro, which seems to be a good utility for doing this if you don't have root access to your phone yet. Uh, it backs up a lot of your data, uh, not necessarily your system image. Uh, it won't get everything, so you want to double check and make sure you've got your photos and videos. It won't back up your Google Authenticator, so you've got to throw that differently. Um, and you know, it won't back up your Bitcoins. Um, that was a relevant issue for me. Um, okay, I'm out of time, so thank you. <laughs>